typically, uh, you know, in these days, I mean, the numbers were a little higher before, and now that with declining sales, it's gone down a little bit. You know, these days you're looking at record deals in the neighborhood of three hundred to four hundred thousand um, dollars as a recording fund, all in, and that means that that you have to pay for everything. Um, and uh, that, you know, like, like recording costs. And recording costs could easily be $300,000 or $200,000 or, you know, $250,000, uh, whatever it might be. So um, it's a little misleading to think, oh, I'll get $400,000 and will I live off of that. You know, the reality is, is um, you know, when you sign a record deal, the chances of the band being able to split $100,000 is pretty slim. You know, the band might be get, splitting somewhere between fifty to a hundred thousand um, dollars, but you know, you got people to pay out of that too. You got to pay your lawyer, which could be anywhere from you know fifteen thousand dollars to twenty-five thousand dollars or more, if you know if they've been working with you for a long time, or depending on what the deal is. Um, you got to pay the manager, you know. So there's 20, typically twenty percent right there, you know. So and uh, then then you split it. So let's pretend you, know, you get $50,000 and you split it four ways, that's only 12.5 each, and you can't even live a year off of that, I mean, nowhere near. Um, so uh, you know, it's, it's not that lucrative of a proposition. And the royalties, the way the royalties are structured, you just won't get any. Um, you know, there's, about, there's about 15 or 20 pages in each contract that explain in a very, rare, very, very roundabout way why you're never going to get any royalties. Um, the gist of it is, if you want to do sort of the back of the thumbnail sketch, is you wouldn't even be entitled to any royalties whatsoever until you've sold about a million records. And when you sell a million records, that doesn't mean you get a million dollar royalty check then. What it means is that after you sell the, you know, the million and one record, you might be getting a royalty on that record. You know, because everything's recoupable, your royalty's very low, you know, you got to pay a lot of people out of that. You know, producers. If you have any samples, you know, anything like that, um, you got to pay all these different people out of that money, and the whole game is kind of rigged so that the artist doesn't really get royalties. What's recoupable? Um, well, more and more things all the time. I mean, you know, recording costs are 100 percent recoupable, um, and um, video costs tend to be 50 percent recoupable from your audio sales and 100 percent recoupable from your video sales, but even then costs over a certain amount um, then become 100% recoupable from audio. And independent promotion is typically either 50 or 100% recoupable, as is independent marketing. Um, you know, all, this different, all these different costs come in from different areas. Um, and it's you know, not at all uncommon to have you know, maybe a million dollars in recoupable costs. I mean, you know, there's some things that aren't, like you know, consumer advertising isn't recoupable. But there's enough recoupable stuff that that you know you really don't collect money you know what i mean what the, it's interesting actually because when my um you know when i was working at capital my first job um i was doing a lot of stuff with blue note records which is owned by capital and uh you know that was sort of a, another part of that story about how i got along and you know how i how i got to where i am was that when um you know business affairs which is where the lawyers are in the record company um, it was very tightly budgeted, and it always is. You know, it's very run very thinly. There's, you know, I think there was three lawyers or something to handle an entire record label, and Blue Note Records. And so what happened was that, you know, typically Blue Note didn't get dealt with. You know, the Blue Note stuff didn't really happen because something was always more pressing on the pop side or the rock side or the hip hop side or whatever. And you know, typically the the um, Blue Note deals were missing a zero, and it made them very uninteresting. So instead of maybe a $300,000 deal, it was a $30,000 deal. So I saw that as an opportunity, and I said, well, why don't you just let me deal with Blue Note, you know, because uh, no one else is, and I can, help, I can help them out. You can look over my work, and this, I'm still in law school when I'm doing this. So I ended up um, de facto being like the head of business affairs for Blue Note um, while I was in law school because I was the only one who was dealing with it, you know, so I was talking to Bruce Lundvall, uh, you know, five, six, seven times a day, you know, we became very close, Tom Everett, all that, it was really great, it was, you know, part of this team, and it was really one of the funnest times of, of my career, where you, you know, it was really, uh, there was sort of a, a esprit de corps, you know, with, uh, with Blue Note, and there was a real sense of identity there. Uh, and what I learned from that, one of the things I learned from that, was that 
you know, jazz musicians, these guys weren't making anything on these deals. I mean, and it wasn't because no one loved them. I mean, Bruce, you know, and Tom, and those guys, you know, they go out of their way all the time. Uh, they did everything they could to make sure that, you know, the musicians, you know, within the realm of, of um, the financial reality of, of their situation, that they would do everything they could for them. They'd try and, you know, get them some money if they needed money. They'd try to, you know, and, you know, when I remember, uh, you know, sadly on more than one occasion where, you know, Bruce would pick up the, the funeral costs for, you know, people when they died. I mean, because no one else was there and they didn't have any money, you know. Um, no, no. I think actually that was just doing the right thing. I mean, you know, Bruce was, uh, is, I, mean, uh, I, I think, still one of the last great record men. You know, kind of guy who would do something because it's the right thing to do. And, you know, and loves musicians and loves being with them, you know, very close over, you know, over the years with different people. Dexter Gordon, I mean, Bruce's in impression of Dexter Gordon is priceless. And the stories he's told me about, you know, Dexter were just fabulous stories. Um, but, but what I learned, one of the things I learned there was that, you know, in the jazz business, um, and I think it's, you could probably fairly say this about a lot of niche markets uh, in music, that they weren't making money off the records. Everybody was unrecouped. The advances, they weren't even really advances. I mean, you know, the $30,000 recording fund, you have to make the record with that. So maybe the artist gets to pocket $5,000, you know, and clearly that's not enough for anything. Um, uh, but what they were doing was that the, the record was a very expensive calling card for everything else they do, uh, you know, for especially their live shows. So, you know, maybe an artist that would be able to maybe pocket $5,000 on releasing their own record, you know, they might be making 5000 a night when they're playing. So that was sort of the game, was to get onto a good record label, especially like Blue Note or Verve, you know, one of the real quality, you know, biggest name labels. Um, and, you know, use that and, and the, the recognition that you get as a result of that to increase their fees for everything else. And that was really where they were making their money on, on the road. Um, and I think that that's something that, that not understanding that is what's made, I think, pop music, and you know, I mean pop in a broad sense, including rock and hip hop and stuff like that, it's made it very difficult for people who, who um, do that music because they look at their royalties, they look at, you know, this, I'm going to get royalties checks from the label, and, you know, I'm going to be rich, and the royalties will just come in every six months, I'll get a check. It doesn't work like that. If they were playing the same game, uh, where they realized that, um, that, you know, the exposure you get from the record company is, you, you then turn around and use that to make money elsewhere, then, um, you know, that's a much more... Um, realistic way to approach your career. And you see that a lot, and uh, I think hip-hop's done a great job of that, where you see, you know, all these people who, uh, who you know, become big, you know, they're into 50 different things all of a sudden, you know, they're, they're doing endorsements for cell phone companies, they're doing um, clothing lines, they're selling merch, they're, you know, making money on their tours and things like that. Um, and that's how that game really works, you know, because what you see, you know, where, where, for instance, it doesn't work is with a rock band. You know, a rock band, when um, they get to the point where they're not making money on the road, then they're screwed, you know, because it, was, it used to be very common, for instance, for, you know, to take a, a young rock band and send them out on the road and do, you know, give them tour support and keep them going. But the problem with that is, is that if you don't make money when you're on the road, where are you going to make money? You know, you're not going to make it on the records very much. You're not going to make it, if you're not making it live, you know, maybe some merch, you know, selling merchandise or something like that, but that's really not enough. You know, I mean, I think that the, the, the correct business model to think about, really, is to, um, at least in most genres, is to be thinking about the live show. Because also, that's the one thing that no one can take from you. You know, if you if you are concerned about people, uh, you know, sharing your files or whatever, uh, or copying your CDs or you know, and not paying you, the one thing that they really can't steal is your live show. And you can use that, um, uh, the you know, the live show to really be the platform for everything else that you do, and everything else kind of fits into it. I mean, not to be, I mean, there is money to be made. I mean, certainly, even as an independent artist, I mean, you could sell your own records. I think that's probably the best way to make money as an independent 
artist. The best way to make money on records as an independent would be to sell your own. But you also have to, at that point, you know, be your own record company. You know, you're not going to make very much if you license it to someone else, or if you, um, uh, you know, sign it over to someone else or something like that. But uh, you stand a chance of making some money if you have sort of the wherewithal to sell them yourself and market them yourself, and you know, and do a good job doing that. I think actually the path for an independent artist and an artist that wants to be signed by a major label is really kind of the same from my perspective. Because the way that, um, that the major labels will, will pick you, it really isn't this concept of, you know, the, this, this idea that, that a record that someone loves comes across their desk and they jump up and down and go, wow, this is really great, I gotta, I gotta sign this, let's go, you know, let's do it. Um, that doesn't really happen anymore. It kind of used to, and, but less and less and less. And what's happened is that over the years, certainly over like the last 10 years, um, or even 20 years maybe, it's gotten just more and more and more competitive. You know, for instance, um, you know, before MTV, you didn't have to look great. After MTV, you had to look great. It wasn't enough that you were, that you were uh, fantastically talented and put on a great show. You also had to look good, and you had to fit into the way that MTV wants you to look. <clears throat> so, you know, that was, that's one thing, and then, um, you know, as time went on, it became more and more and more competitive, and what you start seeing is that, no matter how good your record is, uh, no one really cares unless you're selling them, unless you sold a lot of records. You know, if you sold five or 10,000 records as an independent, that would attract attention. Or getting a lot of uh, airplay, you know, locally, uh, or regionally, or wherever. Or, you know, having a tremendous live draw. I mean, you look at a band like OAR uh, of a Revolution, and they were out there, you know, playing in front of, you know, a thousand people a night and selling a lot of records through CD Baby. And, you know, that's what attracted Lava to sign them, uh, was that activity. And so, really, you see that a lot. You know, it's, it's, that's really the case now. Everybody needs a story. You know, you need to have a story of sales, airplay, uh, you know, people paying to see your show, things like that. So, um, you know, just making a great record and sending it to someone, even if they love it. I mean, they might listen to it every day. You know, they might love it. They'll listen to it with their wife and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, but they, they won't put the money into it. So, uh, the point being that if you're an artist, you have to do that. You know, you have to get that going. You have to get, you know, stoke the fire and get the, you know, get sales and get airplay and whatever it is that you can get because whether you want to go into a, a major label or whether you want to stay independent, it's the same route. I think that the only reason to do it, and it's really part of the major, you know, to, to s actually sell your publishing, you know, to, a, to sell the copyrights, I think the only time you'd really want to do that is if you're in a major label situation, you're signed to a major label, and you need the money. Um, which is really sort of how it worked a lot uh, up until fairly recently. You know, what would happen would be that uh, an artist would get signed to a major record label, and you know, as we talked about a little bit before, the money you get from that major record label on signing is not that much. You know, it's you split it between four people. You got to pay the lawyer. You got to pay the manager. At the end of the day, it's not going to be enough to live on. So what would happen is then you'd turn around and do a publishing deal, and the publishing deal would be maybe another two or three or four hundred thousand dollars of which no cost came out. So now you're talking about some, some real money um, where you can live off of that for a while. So what would happen is you make your record deal and then you make your publishing deal and get the money from that and live off of that while you're hoping that you, know, you get, you get uh, broken and turn into a, a star. Um, now at that point, you know, uh, typically that was, you'd only have to sell half the copyright because you know, when, when especially uh, in those days, it was really, um, you know, that was the, the common deal, was a co-publishing deal. Deals started off originally as being what they call songwriter agreements, where you transfer 100% of the copyright to the publisher, and the money is split 50-50 between the publisher and the writer. And so there's sort of a confusing concept uh, that uh, in publishing where there's the writer's share and the publisher's share. And uh, what that really means is 50% of the money is the publisher's share and 50% of the money is the writer's share. But sometimes you talk about 100% of the writer's share or 100% of the publisher's share, and what you're really saying is 50% of the money. 
So it gets confusing. You have to get used to it a little bit. So uh, originally those deals, you know, the publishers were, um, you know, uh, taking 100% of the copyright. And really the music business started as a publishing business. Um, not everyone realizes that, um, you know, the music business, traditionally the music business was really about song plugging and song publishing and selling sheet music. In the uh, late part of the uh, 19th century and for most of the 20th century, or about half the 20th century, that was really the business. Records only came in later. And so uh, what would, the, typically what would happen is a publisher would, you know, get some uh, songs written for them by someone and get interested in it. The publisher would run around and plug the songs with the big acts of the day. Um, the, they would say, you know, sing this song, sing this song. And um, the, with the idea that if people heard famous singers singing these songs, they'd go buy the sheet music. Because people at that time also, they, they all used to play instruments. You know, I mean, like my mom's generation, um, you know, everyone kind of had something that they played. They played a piano, they sang, you know, it was, it was making music was a more communal thing. It wasn't so, it wasn't quite as audience, you know, audience artist distinction as, as it is now. Um, so uh, at that point, you know, it's, it was kind of a big risk on the, on the publisher's standpoint because uh, they were, they had a lot of work to do. It wasn't like, uh, like with, in the record business, which I'll get to in a second about how it's changed. But, um, you know, and there was payola going on too. I mean, there was all kinds of stuff. You know, they would have, uh, and if you look back at old billboards and old varieties, you know, back from the turn of the century, from the turn of the 20th century, they were all complaining about payola and, you know, and what it costs to plug songs. They would pay, you know, cash payments to, um, um, to you know, singers basically to sing the songs. So anyway, um, that was a justification for uh, the songwriter, I mean, sorry, the publisher owning 100% of the copyright and splitting the money 50-50 was, was actually kind of a lot of work to be done, and it was a risky business. Now, what happened uh, is about, oh, it was about the middle of the 20th century, around 1950 or so, when finally publishing and records, finally records overtook publishing as being the music business. It was generating more money than publishing was. And so what was happening then, this is probably in the 50s and 60s, was that um, what started happening is that um, if you had a record deal, actually it's probably really more towards the 70s, I guess, because uh, at that point in the 50s and 60s, people were still uh, recording other people's songs. And so uh, what happened in the 70s, in the 60s and 70s really, when you had people like the Beatles out there, artists like the Beatles who you know, wrote their own songs and were tremendously uh, successful doing it, and everyone wanted to write their own songs now. You know? And so what happened was that it became very, very common for bands to write their own songs. And even today, like you look, most, most certainly in the rock genre, they know, no one really records anybody else's songs. They pretty much write all their own stuff. Um, so what happened was that the risk was taken out of the music publishing business because what would happen as a writer now you are the writer slash artist. Well, you have a record deal, and you now you know you can go into the publisher and say, "Look, I'm I'm selling. You know, uh, I mean, I have someone here who's going to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars in my career. And you don't have to." So what would happen was really um, the the publishing business was became more of like an investment um, type of business. It was about loans. You know, sort of it was you would parcel out a piece of your copyright. Um, in order to get some money now and give up some future royalties in order to get, you know, current money. Um, and even that would switch. So what happened was you switched to what's called a co-publishing deal, where you, the writer and the, um, and the publisher would now co-own the copyright 50-50, and they'd split the money, um, you know, with the writer still getting their 50%, but then the writer gets another 25% because they co-own the copyright. So they're splitting the, the publishing share. Is why they call it co-publishing. So now the writer gets 75% of the money, basically, because they're they're 100% of the writer's share and 50% of the publisher's share. But and the publisher controls the copyright. Yeah, but the publisher does the administration. Um, and even then, then it's also st one of the other important modifications was that there would be um, uh, what's called retention periods, which means that it's not perpetual rights anymore. You know, like in a modern publishing deal, you won't really see you know perpetual rights. Uh, being signed over to the publisher. It's usually some term of years, seven years, 10 years, 12 years, 15 years, but it's limited and that's important. So you get your copyrights back and you get a second bite at the apple. Now, 
Under those circumstances, that's not a bad deal to make. Um, you know, if someone's going to give you a few hundred thousand dollars for 50% of your copyrights, or uh, 50% of the copyright, and, um, and you get it back someday, you know, in the, say, then in 10, 15 years, that's a pretty good deal. You know, I don't have any problem. I, I think there's a lot of good reasons to do that deal. Now, the other kind of deal that can be done is uh, more of just an administration deal, where the artist, or the, I'm sorry, the writer keeps 100% of the copyright and just licenses it, basically, licenses the administration rights to someone for a while so that they don't, so that the writer doesn't have to do all the paperwork and, you know, issue licenses and do all that kind of stuff. Someone else takes care of it for them. And, you know, the, typically those, those rates, you know, the administrator would charge somewhere between 10 and 20 percent um, for those services. And those deal, deals tend to be fairly short, you know, three to five year range, two, sometimes even two years or one year, depending on how much leverage you might have at the time. So, um, long story short, though, it's important to own your own copyrights, and uh, you know that's why I think that, the, 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 for instance, the publishing business is a much gentler business in a way because you're not getting your copyrights taken away from you in, in the normal course of business. The record business, in the normal course of business, you're going to lose your copyrights uh, in the sound recordings, at least. You know, certainly as an independent artist or um, uh, someone who who's just maybe even wants to be on a major label someday but isn't yet. The most, most important thing I would say is make sure you keep all your copyrights um, because you might not understand it right the second and you're thinking about today and you're thinking about being a star now but those copyrights will last longer than you. Um, you know those copyrights are you know the term of copyright by definition is is life plus or currently it's life plus 70 so and it's probably only going to get longer. So that's, these are things that you can own. These are real assets. But, you know, as you sort of get older, you start to realize that if you start when you're 18 and you make a record every couple of years, you know, and you manage your career in a good way and, you, and you're able to sort of make it work, you know, you're able to keep it together and maybe you're not, you know, super rich and a super big rock star, but, but you're making money, you know. And that every year, or every couple of years, you're going to have a bunch of new copyrights. And you're going to have, you know, this album when you're 18, and this album when you're 20, and this album when you're 22.